All right, let's turn our attention to the biblical text for today. Amen, amen, amen. We are uh, literally moving into uh, a time where uh, our liturgical calendar is starting to wind down and we're preparing ourselves to enter into a new season of worship. And uh, this day is across the world known as All Saints Day. Uh, this Sunday is a time where literally the church universal takes uh, some time to, to, to literally uh, amplify and to uplift the unique ways that uh, everyday people in our churches are uh, living lives so exemplary that they are worthy of being modeled. Sometimes we uh, create these tiers of significance in church hierarchies that make folk uh, think that uh, you know, their lives are more exemplary than others. But how many of you can appreciate that often it is the ordinary person that uh, engages in extraordinary acts of faithfulness and impact that literally make the world go round? Amen. And that uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, particularly in a community of folks who appreciate that we have a historic connection to faithful folks all across the world at every time in history, that there's never a time where God does not have somebody being faithful to what it means to be a, a, a reflection of God's ultimate and original intent. And so All Saints Day, it venerates, it, it, it amplifies, it celebrates uh, those individuals who have been sainted, if you will, uh, in some of our traditions. But, you know, some of us, uh, we come out of the uh, holiness tradition, the Pentecostal holiness traditions, and they said everybody was a saint. Amen. Said so when you get uh, the power of the Holy Ghost running through you, it sanctifies you. And then you become a saint. You ought to lift your hand and holler, I am a saint. Praise God. And then some of y'all like, you know what I did last night, Pastor Mike. You prayed my strength <coughs> in the Lord. Amen. Well, you can say, I'm a saint by faith. Praise God. Saint by redemption. I'm a saint because of the work of God. Mm. Amen, 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 amen. And so it's so important for us uh, to appreciate that there is something, though, that is worthy of celebration in your life. That all the things that you have gone through and yet you're still standing, you may be wavering from time to time, but I want you to know that the fact that you are still standing, standing with questions, but you're still standing. Standing with tears streaming down your face, but you're still standing. How many know that sometimes it is just the, 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 the fact that I'm still here? It is the greatest expression of God's work in my life. Mm -hmm. You ought to give your neighbor a quick fake high five and tell them I'm still here. Amen. That, some, 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 some folks used to, used to you know, say miracles uh, don't happen anymore. And you ought to tell them you ought to just look at me. Praise God. Because I am a miracle in the faithfulness of God. And so Ephesians is a text that comes to us on this All Saints Day. And it is an admonition of uh, the writers, the, the followers, the little the, the mentees of uh, those who were in the kind of school, if you will, the, the influence of the Pauline kind of apostolic uh, trajectory. That Paul wrote so many letters to so many cities in particular uh, parts of uh, the Roman Empire and, and Ephesians is thought to have been like the collection of Paul's greatest hits. It is that, uh, you know, you know, when you're trying to recap uh, someone's significant speeches, like one of my favorite uh, 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 preachers, activists, exemplars is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And man, I love Dr. King. I have so many anthologies of Dr. King's speeches. Strength to love. I have a number of speeches. Chaos, a community or chaos. Where do we go from here? It is the collection of Dr. King's greatest hits, greatest speeches. Well, the book of Ephesians is very similarly a collection of some of Paul's most important themes. Themes that he perpetually re 
articulated to the church dealing with struggle and, and, and persecution in a context whereby the Roman Empire was attempting to continue to spread its impact, influence all across the region. And here you found a church trying to find its sea legs about 100 years after the death of Jesus. They are themselves thinking that Jesus is going to come back in our lifetime. But as they get older and a little longer in the tooth, they start to realize, well, maybe Jesus is going to come back in my child's lifetime, so let me make sure I can pass on to them the truths that have been really a part of my life, my cultural and spiritual and emotional well-being. How many of you know that one of our greatest tasks as followers of Jesus is to live a life in such a way where it can be passed down to the next generation? Hello, somebody. That in a time when we are becoming post-religious and dare I even say post-Christian, there is an important role for the body of Christ, for the church, to hold fast to the life that the saints, those exemplars, the ordinary followers of the ways of Jesus have literally put flags and stakes in the ground that exist to this day. The idea that we should take care of the widows and the orphans. How many of you know that's not a new concept? That is something that literally was a commitment of the earliest followers of Jesus. The idea that what we will do today in the taking of the Eucharist celebration, that is another practice that for thousands of years have been passed down from generation across time and place. Why? So we can remember the purpose, the function, and dare I even say the, the, the benefit of sharing in a broken body and the shared sacrifice for a greater cause that is indeed salvific. The act of baptism, the act of gathering, all of these things are things that we continue to do, not just as a ritual to check a box, but it is our way of living into a living, breathing history that unites us across all of our differences. And so this passage is speaking to a church that's trying to continue to find its way. And I love these words. We're gonna be in Ephesians chapter number one, verse number 11. And uh, uh, we'll go down to verse number 17 in the interest of time here. Uh, the scripture, uh, Paul is talking, or at least uh, the words of Paul attributed, talking to those readers. And verse number 17, it says very loudly, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. Somebody say, I got to come to know him. Amen. Come on, say it again. I've got to come to know him. That means that the more you come to God, the more you get to know God. Amen. The God does not just unscrew your head and pour all the knowledge into you one uh, sitting at a time. How I many know God speaks to us through our trials and tribulations? God speaks to us through our, our, our moments of celebration. God speaks to us through those times of silence and isolation. But the more we come to God, the more we get to know God. Verse number 18, we want to know God. Why? So that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which God has called you. What are the riches of God's glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of God's power for us who believe according to the working of God's great power? For God put this power to work in Christ when God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to talk from a few moments, uh, just a simple title, Stay the Course. Stay the Course, Stay the Course, Stay the Course. Let's pray just for a few moments. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you, Lord, to hide this word in our hearts so we won't sin against you. And as I stand here to teach and preach your word, I pray, God, that you will send an anointing that makes preaching 
and teaching easy. Bless the hearers and the listeners of your word. May we all grow in faith. Bless, oh God, this journey of faith we are on. May it bring life to us and strength to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. As I stated, I've been home, uh, you know, quite ill for the past month or so, and so much has happened. I made a long list of things that have happened that if I had preached every Sunday over the last month, I'd probably be covering all kinds of these topics. Amen. Kanye West, amen. Sermon all by himself. Kyrie, sermon all by himself. The death of takeoff, sermon all by himself. The firing of Tiffany Cross and the disparate treatment of black media professionals, sermon all by itself. Midterm elections, inflation, Twitter. Y'all better get off that fascist no, sermon. All, the role of social media, disinformation, <clears throat> COVID-19, economic desperation, and how that informs so much of what some would like to describe as a crime wave, loneliness and depression, gun violence, robberies, or as the kids call it, bipping, amen. It means you better not leave nothing in your car, you're gonna get bipped. <laughs> Trying to raise kids during a very challenging season, sustaining healthy relationships, building life-giving partnerships and marriages, drug overdose, fentanyl is on a, raging rampage through our communities, sex trafficking, unexpected tragedies that come visit your life without your invitation. How I many know things come knocking on your door and you like, man, I didn't give you my address. <laughs> Christian nationalism, Christo-fascism, anti-intellectualism, the growing fissures within black communities as well as across other cultural and racial groups. All of these are worthy of some commentary, I believe, from uh, we who are trying to help us all make sense. What it means to follow Jesus in a moment and in a time where uh, we have so many voices competing for our attention and inviting us to subscribe to them authority related to our next steps. I thought in my times of prayer and reflection and thinking about uh, my personal vocation, our shared life here as a congregation, what does it mean to keep re reminding ourselves that all of these challenges, even those that are happening in our own lives, is a stark, kind of reminder that all of creation is groaning. Scriptures talk about that uh, creation is groaning and waiting for the revelation of the people of God, that God is always trying to give birth to something new. But in the uh, emergence of something new, how many of you know, for many of us, the new can feel like a threat to the old, or at least to the status quo. And for we who are people of God, how many know that one of the most persistent messages that we always like to lift up is that we are people of resurrection? That we follow a God, uh, one, another one of the lectionary passages talks about that our God is not the God of the dead, but our God is the God of the living. Because the writer, uh, the gospel writer says that even those who think they are dead in God, they are still alive. I mean, this idea, right, that we are always hopefully powerfully and effectively trying to preach to us, to ourselves, that God is doing something that you may not fully be able to perceive right now in your life. Isn't that part of our message, right? Like you come to church and you're, 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 you're singing about the Jehovah Jireh. Why are we singing about Jehovah Jireh? Because we are trying to convince you that in the midst of all of the lack, in the midst of all the economic desperation, in the midst of all of the deficits you're being told you and we have, that God is enough. 
We're not just singing that because, you know, it got a nice tune, although it does. We're not singing that because it's the hottest song out there. No, there's, there's, some, there's, some, there's some intentionality in what we are trying to, week by week, remind you as God's people is happening. But how many of you know that you don't get to live your life uh, at church in front of the worship team every day? <laughs> Somebody say amen. And as much as you know, you, you may like the preaching of our staff here and our team, you don't get to hear us in your ear every day unless you, you know, doing a podcast thing or something like that. I don't know. That the messages we tell you are actually placed in your mind right next to the doom and gloom stuff you got to deal with on your job. The bad novels that you read that, you know, trying to help you find love in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the bad news that you get from your doctor. The bullets that you hear shooting up in the air at all times of the night hoping that they don't run through your house. That all of the things that we're trying to remind you of as relates to God is doing something new. Some of us sitting in our house like, man, God, well, everything looks kind of the same to me. <laughs> don't have anybody talk to the Lord like that, praise God. It's okay to tell the truth in church, amen, in the presence of the Lord on a Sunday, amen. Lie every other day, but tell the truth on Sunday, right? Why? Because I have found that sometimes it's easier to lie to ourselves than to tell ourselves the truth. We often say that beautiful lies are dangerous. And the ugly truth, even though it may save your life, we still avoid them. And part of what I hope you and I can appreciate in this moment is that there is an expectation for us as God's people to not be uh, folk who are easily pushed off of our spot as it relates to our confidence in what God has said and what God is doing. I want you to know that one of the most important things that the scriptures often tell us by the apostle writers is we are here to remind you of God's words. Remind you of God's promises. Even though there are moments of revelatory knowledge, <clears throat> how many of you know that sometimes you just need a good reminder? <clears throat> I don't always need, you know, just nice new information. It's kind of like, you know, uh, I, I remember some time ago I was talking to the worship team and I said, you know, uh, I love new songs, but sometimes I just want to hear an old song that I got to think that hard about. Amen. Why? Because I just want to be reminded of something that I already know that is bringing life to me. How many know there's something that God has already told you, child of God, that if you remind yourself of that, it will be a source of life to you. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I can use a little bit of life today, amen. I can use a little bit of life today, and that is why I find this passage to be so important because in a moment where people are looking for direction, looking for a place to land and a space to be where you know that there's something better for you here than where you came from. I want you to know, child of God, that there is a better place for you. In the book of Haggai, you know, I was going to preach that passage, but I felt like I didn't get enough time of study, so I had to pivot over to Ephesians, praise God. But the book of Haggai says that in the last day, the scripture says that God will shake up everything. God will shake up the heavens and God will shake up the earth and God will fill the temple with all this new stuff and the glory of this the latter place will be greater than the glory of the former. I'm going to have to preach it later, but it was going to be called, Your Ladder Shall Be Greater. Praise God. Man, but I need a little more time on that one. Somebody say amen. Uh, but but the, 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 the purpose or the function of the ladder, some of us don't get to the latter, L-A-T-T-E-R, because we throw in the towel along the way. How many of you know that sometimes throwing in the towel feels a lot easier than pressing through the hardships? Lord, help me to talk to somebody in here today. Some of us, some of us got to keep reminding ourselves that I got to keep pressing forward. And that's why, you know, as a church, we, we try to amplify issues of justice. Why? Because our 
journey as a people in a land that has constantly figured out ways to dehumanize us and belittle us and limit our access to rights and privileges, you know that even though there's still a challenge today, things aren't what they used to be back in the day. I remember I was, I was talking to one of my friends and I, I was telling someone, you know, uh, th this story, you know, I travel a lot and I get into Ubers and stuff and I be continuing calls in the Uber, so I, I'm gonna try to be very succinct with this story, but I got in the car and, and a brother, you know, I was talking about, I was fussing about something related to one of my meetings at the White House and, you know, he's ear hustling, you know, and, you know, trying to like, you know, get all in my conversation. I hang, he hang up the phone. He said, my brother, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He's like, did I hear you say the White House? Like, are you talking about like the White House, like the White House? I said, oh boy. <laughs> I said, no, yeah, absolutely. And he began asking me all these series of questions. And then he started asking me about how, did I, how do I know that slavery really happened? Now, this is a brother, you know, it's, you know, one, one of these brothers, you know, looking for knowledge, praise God. And he started to say, you know, actually, black people, we are the Native Americans. And slavery was made up by, you know, uh, academics to keep us in a, a second caste system. And, you know, that was a new one, praise God, because I've heard a lot of, I heard a lot of theories, praise God. A lot of, a lot of conversations about a lot of things. And, you know, uh, depending on, you know, what, where, where I feel like today, you know, if, if, if I got time, I'll engage you. If I don't, I'll just be like, well, you know, uh, there's lots of theories out here, dear brother, and I hope you uh, find your way. But not today, you know, I engaged with him and had a good conversation and, and you, know, you know, he obviously was questioning all authority and I can understand and appreciate because you know, I work with a lot of young fellas who don't have a good sense of, of what it means to trust in narratives. Why? Because most of the narratives being told to most young brothers is a narrative that is about their deficiency. Most of the first opportunity young brothers get to have with systems that produce narratives, whether they be schools, churches, government, it is a deficit interaction. And so for many of these young brothers, it is a survival mechanism for them to try to figure out how can I make meaning of my life when all the narratives I've been told have actually diminished my life. So, you know, I have a little patience for some of these folk who don't know better but some of these folk <laughs> should know better but it brought me to this idea and to this point you know i said i just want you to know young brother that not all knowledge is the same some knowledge need not require such full commitment Oh, no, brother, no, brother. That's okay. He, now, you know, he picked me up in a Tesla. He's an Uber driver driving a Tesla. No judgment on the south side of Chicago. It was one of the best rides I've ever had. But I said, if, you know, you, ha you have a neighborhood repair man. Oh, of course I do. You know, yeah, the neighborhood mechanic. I said, if a neighborhood mechanic uh, came to you and said, I can build you a Tesla for $20,000, would you trade in your Tesla for their Tesla? Hmm. I don't know. I said, come on, black man. I need you to tell me the truth. There's something about this factory warranted, tested Tesla that you're willing to put your hard earned money behind. Why? Because you don't want to make a bad investment. Now, the, the neighborhood mechanic could give you a great looking car with all the nice bells and whistles on the outside, but I guarantee you there's a reason why he could do it at $20,000 and someone else would t probably take $80,000. And I want you, young fella, to just think about how much investment are you willing to make in someone's production of something that may not be as tried and tested as someone else who actually has a little bit more expertise. I want you to think about that when it comes to your soul, dear loved one. Because some of us will trust uh, a trained mechanic with our car, but won't trust an untrained uh, scholar with our mind. We'll trust a, 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 a trained doctor with our heart, but won't trust an untrained preacher with your soul. 
And I think some of us need to keep reminding ourselves, as the scripture has said, just in this moment here, that God gives you knowledge to know him. Why? So you can be enlightened and be clear about what God is doing in your life and what God is doing in the world. I want you to know that God does not seek to bless you individually and leave the rest of the world to hell in a handbasket. God wants you to be well, just as the neighborhood you live in is well, just as your city is well, just as our country and the world is well. God ain't just concerned about you. Who are you? <laughs> Praise God. You're somebody important, but you're not so important at the expense of all of creation. And how many of you know there is a practice of Christian faith that often seeks to elevate the individual rather than maintain the collective? And I want you to appreciate, even though you may read the Bible like it was written to you personally, the Bible was actually written to the plural. It was written to the collective we. So let me give you three things that I just want you to be careful of if you're going to stay the course. Staying the course means that, God, I'm clear about what you are up to. I'm clear about what you are doing. I'm clear about the path that I must stay on. And I realize the first thing, I must guard against deception. Huh. Somebody holler, guard against deception. How many of you know that to be deceived is sometimes an accidental thing for many of us? How many of you can acknowledge that there are people who will willfully tell you a lie and a half truth just to keep you misinformed? They are a deceptor. Their goal is not to help you. Their goal is to ensure that the information you have leaves you powerless in your mind, your soul, your body, and your spirit. How many can attest that through the course of my life, I've met people who told me things that were not true. And it took the school of hard knocks. <laughs> Somebody say amen. Amen. Some of, you, some of us like, I didn't, I didn't get the PhD from Cal. I got it from the school of hard knocks. Amen. I got lumps on my head. I got uh, uh, scars on my heart. I, I, I have a fractured mind because I listened to the school of hard knocks. People who constantly told me things that were not true. I want you to know that it is not always our fault when you are deceived by people who you trust in. Sometimes you and I have to actively train ourselves how to spot a deceptor. You and I have to teach ourselves. You, you know, every time, you know, when, when I was doing my, my, uh, my, my, my drug and alcohol training classes, you know, and they, they, they would tell us, how do you know an addict is lying? Some of y'all laugh because you know what I'm about to say because some of y'all been through the program, right? They say, when their mouth is moving, praise God. <laughs> because for many of us, we have become Use to lies, lies, and more lies. But it is a different thing for you to be used to your own lies and for you to accept the lies of other people. Jesus said it like this, if the blind lead the blind, you both fall in a ditch. So the way you can tell, listen, this is some free game that I'm giving you. The way you can tell if someone is a deceptor is if you keep falling in a ditch after they give you information. Because the truth will always set you free. Some people lie to you about your finances. How you know if, you, if, if you're getting bad information if you keep falling in a ditch. Some of you, some folk will lie to you about your own, your own work, your own productions, your own, your own self. How do you know? Because you are not advancing in life. First question that I want you to think about, how are you actively training yourself to not be deceived by false narratives and beautiful lies? What makes up your community of counsel? You know what a counsel is? The scripture says that there is safety in the multitude, in a community of counselors. I have a community of counselors. Some folk call it a kitchen cabinet. Everybody should have some folk who are not related to you. 
<laughs> Somebody say amen. I mean, you, you can have a couple, you know, who, who maybe, you know, agree with everything you say. But you better run it by some folk who actually have a different perspective than you, who know a little bit more than you, who been a little bit further down the road than you. Who is your counsel when it comes to your spiritual walk, when it comes to your economic life? When it comes to your social, relational, and intellectual life, can you verify that these folks are not deceptors? I don't know. If I have more time, I come down your road, but I don't. You ought to thank God that the time is leaving us. Uh, the second thing that I want you to think about is we must reduce distractions. So the first thing is, you know, I got to, you know, beware of deception. The second thing is I must learn to reduce Distractions. A deception is different than a distraction. A deception is willfully trying to lead you in the wrong direction. A distraction is trying to cause you to lose focus on the unique road you are called to walk down. People will purposely, or your environment may create Events or circumstances that, listen, are designed or may cause you to move your eye off the prize. Somebody holler, get rid of my distractions. It'll cause you to forget what your priority is. <laughs> How many of you know that you got some priorities this week? How many of you got some priorities this month? I mean, you got some priorities this year. Distractions are intended to cause you to lose your focus on that which you can uniquely impact. So I invite you to respond to everything. I've had folks calling me while I was sick on my, not deathbed, but it felt close some days. Pastor Mike, what do you think about this? Can you comment on that? Can you fly here? I said, no, I'm trying to live. God bless you. I'll talk to you when I can talk without wheezing. Goodbye. For a month, my focus was just trying to get well. And how many know some folk didn't understand it? I got offered the key to the city of Oakland. They called me twice. Wanted to give me the key to the city twice while I was sick. I said, well, you have to wait till I get well because I'm not coming outside to get no key. But Pastor Mike, this is the key to the city. I said, well, if you want me to have it today, I can have it next month. <laughs> you sure? I mean, I, I guess. I don't know. I'm sick. My focus. What do you think about Kyrie Kanye? Uh, my focus. I'm, I have a focus. I'm trying to stop black boys from being shot down in the street. I don't know what to think about them brothers. I hope they figure it out. <laughs> Hello, somebody. What do you think about that? What do you think about this? What do you, I, well, I have a focus. And the problem with too many of us is we allow distractions to get us off of our focus. That's why the scripture says a double-minded person is what? Unstable. Unstable in a few of their ways. One or two of their ways. Can I get a three or four of their ways? Oh. oh. I'm not calling for us to just be ignoring what's happening around you, but how sometimes you have to steal yourself and ask God, what is my focus? How do I stay the course during this season of my life when there are always things trying to distract me from God's desires for me? And we, who God has placed in my life. So, I've had to develop a distraction meter, and I'm going to invite you to do that. Is your distraction meter at an all-time high? How do you know? What practice can you employ related to, listen, meditation, reflection? You know, when you're sick and you can't do nothing, you reflect about a lot of things. You think about life. Cause you know, some of us been made to think that if you know, if if you go away, the whole thing just you know, the world gonna stop. My dad used to tell me, one monkey don't what, stop a show. Things keep moving. Folks are sorry. Oh, I'm sorry you sick. Sorry you're you're gone. I'm sorry it is. I'm sorry you that. 
but things keep going and so it causes you to reflect what is most important for my family, for my, my vocation, for my calling? What is meditation, reflection, and mindfulness doing to help you stay clear? Lord, have mercy. My time is leaving me about your divine purpose and your calling. And then the last thing, I told you a couple things to avoid. Let me tell you one thing to do. Cultivate. Everybody say cultivate. cultivate. Discernment. 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 You know what it means to discern? It means you have the gift and the art of perception. You have the ability to decide between difficult choices, knowing that they all may lead you in a certain direction. It is the ability to ascertain what is legitimate and what is false. It is to uh, re be able to judge what is the right or well thing to do. Oh, I'm gonna have to preach another message on, on this last point because it deserves a longer unpacking. But how many of you know one of the last, not last, one of the least, left the E out, least active gifts in so many of our lives is the gift of discernment. And I tell people, if you lack discernment, you better have a great counsel of multitude. Because there's nothing worse than, the scripture says, there is a way that le seems right unto you, but the end is destruction. That, that might as well be the tagline for the School of Hard Knocks. You know what the challenge is, School of Hard Knocks? Some people don't make it back. Or if you come through the School of Hard Knocks, you come through not always intact. So why learn from the School of Hard Knocks when you could cultivate discernment? You, as a follower of Jesus, have access to the Holy Spirit. And I'm not talking about some spooky, deep force of, you know, gold Voldemort and, the, you, know, you know, all the science shows that we all like to watch. I'm talking about the living, breathing source of life that God emanated into creation that animates all of us. I know some of us, we may think we're too sophisticated and intellectual to appreciate what the Holy Spirit can do in your life, but the Holy Spirit can do everything you can't. <laughs> How about that? What is the Holy Spirit? It is the extra I need. You know, when you do everything you know how to do, the Holy Spirit is the extra. Some say it's even what you've done, but, you know, I'm going to give you some you know, agency. I'm not trying to make you, you know powerless but how many know i need the power of the holy spirit i need god's spirit moving in me and breathing in me and healing and advising and leading me and the holy spirit will often allow what is happening in my life to be affirmed by my counsel of discernment hopefully that is connected to a tradition of scripture and 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 and, and example so we're not just all out here disparate in many different directions. Cultivating discernment means that you have to learn how to make better decisions with the information you have at hand. How do you get good, better discernment? You find someone whose discernment you trust. You sit at their feet. It's kind of like, you know, I, I see some of our educators here, you know, when, you, when you're trying to get your PhD, how many of you knows, you know, Sometimes it is about who you study with. <laughs> and I know some folks who are getting their PhD is like, man, this person, I wish I never met them. And some folks change all in the middle. It's just that disruptive. Oh, this, man, this is, wow. <laughs> no, I wish I didn't even learn about this thing. But you can study with someone who can teach and train and mentor you well. Child of God, my hope is that we stay the course. These elections are coming up. Don't believe the foolishness running out here in these streets. Now, I know some of us, we're incubated from it if we live here in California in the Bay Area, but I tell people all the time, 
The worst conditions of the Bay Area is not because of the Trump Republicans. Man, I was in a meeting and they got me all riled up. I said, everything I learned about racism and white supremacy, I learned it from progressives in the Bay Area. Pastor Mike. <laughs> so I didn't grow up in Mississippi. I didn't grow up in Alabama. I grew up in San Francisco. I pastor in Berkeley and everything. Can I say everything? everything. I've learned about the anti-blackness that wars against the soul, the, 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 the xenophobia that makes people feel like they don't belong, the violence against people on the margins. Everything I learned about it, I learned about it in the Bay Area. So you better look to people who will do with their actions what they say they're going to do with their mouth. You better vote the right way. Don't be listening to these folk who got a gift of gab. Lie to you in your face and tell you is, uh, I need stand to your feet, everybody. <laughs> and grab somebody by the hand. The practice of communion, we have in communion today. The practice of communion is so important. I, I, again, I, I have to talk about this so much <clears throat> more at a different time, but I, I, I do just want to say that one of the great gifts of communion in people's search for meaning, in people's search for like cultural significance, is that we who are descendants of the African slave trade and we who are descendants of the <clears throat> Native American genocides and we, we who are displaced, we may never fully recover our history with the kind of clarity that so many of us may desire. But part of why I want you to always be reminded that life in the way of Jesus is a beautiful invitation. It's because we are being invited into a way of life that the scripture says there are no more Jew nor Greek, male or female, rich or poor, slave or free. But all of us, everybody say all of us, we have our humanity, our dignity, our fullest expression of what it means to be human in Christ. It does not negate the importance of the knowledge of self, but I want you to know, child of God, that for all who are having a crisis of identity, in God you can find some peace that can bring you over those troubled waters while you make your journey. And you can do so in a way where you don't have to get caught up in the entanglements of this world. Entanglements are different than stewardship. Entanglements mean I'm just connected to something a little bit too much and inappropriately. But stewardship means that I'm acting with intentionality to influence that which has been placed in my hand. So God, I pray for your people today who are seeking strength and clarity wisdom and knowledge i pray god for the power that comes from your spirit may it be lord freely flowing in the life in the family the relationships the persons represented in this congregation today i pray god that you will rebuke the enemy that wars against our soul i pray god that you will remind us that there is a path set before us and we must eschew deceptions. We must reject them. We must be mindful of distractions. We must limit them. And God, we must cultivate discernment so we can make choices that please you and bring life to us. So God bless us. Heal us, save us, free us, and liberate us 
from all forms of sin, both personal, collective, spiritual. God, may we be a people living in freedom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Thank you.